Hey everyone, this is Dr. Russo. Let's equip you with recent research updates on how to best use some of the common tools in the gut health arsenal, prebiotics, fiber, and also either a Mediterranean or a low FODMAP diet. One of the things I've observed is people have no shortage of available tools, but rather it's the how to use those tools that can be problematic. So we'll detail for you how to use these tools so as to reduce your gut symptoms, whether it be SIBO, leaky gut, constipation, what have you. If we get the use of the tools right, we should have the downstream effect of alleviation of these symptoms. So let's kick off. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. To start, there's a very interesting, and by the way, sorry, my uh, setup here is different. I'm traveling, so I may not be as smooth with some of these slides or um, studies I wanna quote for you, but the first study is seminal. Uh, albeit my presentation of it may be a little bit choppy. It was a meta-analysis on the use of prebiotics. Now, prebiotics feed bacteria. Probiotics are the bacteria. There was a lot of hubbub around prebiotics if you went back five plus years ago. There was kind of this renaissance of the microbiota and how important it is for us to feed our gut bugs so we have a healthy microbiota and therefore all of the benefits one can reap from having said healthy microbiota. However, this is not what the clinical research is bearing out. We're actually seeing that for the most part, aggressively feeding your gut bacteria with high-dose prebiotic supplements can be detrimental. Enter this meta-analysis summarizing 11 randomized controlled trials, and they found that prebiotic supplementation led to no improvement in the symptoms of IBS gas, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, or an oscillation of the two. And they did look at different prebiotics. So helpful in the sense that it wasn't just one. They examined inulin, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, and galacto-oligosaccharides, leading these researchers to conclude, quote, prebiotics do not improve gastrointestinal symptoms or quality of life in patients with IBS, but they do increase bifidobacteria. That last note I think is important, and it hints at a concept we've been discussing on the podcast for a while, which is it's more important in the realm of functional GI or digestive care to treat the person and not their lab values. Because as this study found, bifidobacteria levels did increase, but people became no healthier. We can combine that with another trial from just this year, looking at prebiotics again for leaky gut. And they found that prebiotics did not improve leaky gut when looking at a placebo versus inulin. So there was no impact on zonulin and also no impact on depression, which was another marker tract in this study. So all of this to say, while the hypothesis of feeding your healthy gut bacteria is attractive, when you look at the hard science, and we actually test these things in randomized control trials, we do not see sadly, that prebiotic supplementation improves symptoms or improves leaky gut. But as we've also discussed, a very pivotal paper just this year published in Frontiers in Immunology, they found that probiotics do improve leaky gut. And again, this was a meta-analysis, so a summary of multiple clinical trials finding that supplementation with probiotics not only improve leaky gut, but also, as you would expect, had a corresponding impact on leveling out or correcting imbalances in the microbiota, as well as lowering inflammatory cytokines. So all this to say and sort of conclude that when thinking about feeding the bacteria or actually supplementing with the bacteria, so prebiotics or probiotics, clearly the evidence now is indicating that probiotics are the way to go. And I just wanted to share with you in brief here, the meta protocol we've been developing for a few years now, which organizes the different probiotic formulas into easy to understand categories. Typically blends of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are the one type that are studied, or a Saccharomyces boulardii fungus, the second type that's often studied, or a soil-based probiotic, which usually contains bacillus, streptococcus, enterococcus, and 
The dosages of the Lactobif blends are one to 10 billion per day, although higher is okay. For the Saccharomyces fungus, anywhere between 10 and 15 billion per day. And for the soil-based probiotic, anywhere between two and six billion, all in CFU per day. And for a minimum duration of two to three months, because remember, we've been seeing a number of papers published this year that have found it may take two or three months to realize the full benefit of supplementing with a probiotic. Now, you should generally see some indication of benefit before the second or third month, but the apex of improvement may not be achieved until the second or third month. And this is looking at multiple conditions and trying to summarize to a simple protocol that will give you the highest yield. So there are what I feel some very important updates on prebiotics again, because there was uh, you know, all, all this um, fanfare about prebiotics. And while that was an attractive hypothesis, again, feed your gut bacteria, we're really seeing now quite clearly with meta-analysis level data that unfortunately the prebiotics, at least supplementally, don't seem to be that beneficial. By the way, if this video has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Curious to hear your thoughts. And this way you'll also see future videos from us. Now on the topic of leaky gut, we just covered that prebiotics don't appear to help leaky gut, but probiotics do. I wanted to share with you three interesting studies looking at correlations between leaky gut and various conditions. The first one in children who had ADHD. What they found in this study was that kids with ADHD, as compared to healthy controls, had four times higher levels of serum or blood zonulin. So probably not surprising. Another study looked at participants who had the autoimmune condition vitiligo and also found higher levels of serum zonulin, probably the best marker of leaky gut in those with the autoimmune condition vitiligo. And the final study I wanted to share here looked at an association between either Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment to leaky gut and did find that those with either condition had higher measures of leaky gut than did their healthy control cohorts. Again, hopefully this is empowering because we just covered very compelling data from frontiers in immunology finding that probiotic supplementation can reduce leaky gut. So I share this not to make you scared if your child has ADHD or if you have vitiligo or if you have some sort of cognitive impairment, but rather to empower you because there are simple things probiotics that can be helpful in remedying that leaky gut. Now, coming over to fiber, fiber and prebiotics are similar, but different. Fiber, I think we can make more of a case, especially for improving bowel regularity. The prebiotics are going to be obviously very rich in prebiotics, whereas fiber will have some prebiotics, but typically a lot less. But what the fiber can do is help to bulk the stool and also help bind and detoxify certain things through the feces. The first study here looked at what type of fiber was best for improving IBS. And this was a meta-analysis across 16 trials because remember, they're looking at different types of fiber. So they're going to compare a few studies on prebiotics, a few studies on psyllium, a few studies on pectin, and a few studies on wheat bran. And when examining across all these 16 clinical trials, they found that the best for improving regularity were psyllium and pectin, usually at a dose of 10 grams or higher per day, needing to be used for about a month or more. So if you are someone who's struggling with IBS, especially if you're struggling with constipation, then either psyllium or pectin are things that you should consider. And this piggybacks nicely onto another study wherein they looked at the ability of psyllium versus placebo to improve IBS symptoms in kids and found that psyllium was superior to placebo for improving IBS in children. And because of this, it's probably no surprise that the American College of Gastroenterology states as follows, we strongly recommend the use of psyllium for improving IBS symptoms. Now to be careful, fiber can be a double-edged sword. You will see some times flaring of constipation, especially if someone's not drinking enough water or flaring of bloating, gas, and pressure, which is why I personally recommend to use something like probiotics and dietary changes first, calm down some of your symptoms, and that's the ideal most opportune time to then perform a trial on psyllium. 
for a Cilium protocol, if you will, start with anywhere between five to 10 grams per day. You can work up to as high as 25 grams per day, but that is pretty high. So more does not mean better. In fact, this is a great example of where I think we should all be looking for the minimal effective dose. Again, regarding water, make sure to drink water amply, 12 to 20 ounces per day with the psyllium is a good target. And I'll put up here on the screen for you two psylliums that I like, one from now and then one from Organic India. And before you do anything, always make sure to check with your healthcare provider. And the final few studies look at diet. And I want to preface by saying it's important to distinguish and, and to acknowledge that not all trials on diet will find a given diet is always beneficial. So let me plant that comment and then share the few studies and circle back to how we reconcile this. So the first study found that greater adherence to a Mediterranean diet actually flared IBS symptoms. To quote, our study suggests that a standard Mediterranean diet may not be suitable for all participants with IBS and likely needs to be personalized in those with increased symptoms. Now, if we look at the Mediterranean diet, and I'll just share a diagram with you here on the screen, the basis of the Mediterranean diet I like, which is physical activity and hydration. But the first food recommendation rung of this pyramid is high in grains, rice, pasta, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And as you're probably suspecting, these are all or mostly high FODMAP foods. And so the reason why the Mediterranean diet might be problematic is due to the high consumption of prebiotic or FODMAP rich foods. And what's empowering about this is that with a low FODMAP diet, a temporary adherence to lowering FODMAPs typically leads to improvement when reintroducing FODMAPs a few months later. And let's cover a recent study that found just that thing. This study looked at a low FODMAP diet and it was very large, 21,000 individuals. It was observational, so take this with a small grain of salt, but they found that after one to two months, the low FODMAP diet led to greater or equal than a 50% reduction in symptoms of abdominal pain, gas and bloating, diarrhea, and constipation. So again, clearly the low FODMAP diet is helpful for digestive symptoms. However, here's the key aspect I wanted to weave in. Upon reintroduction, after one to two months, over 50% of the foods that were cut out were able to be reintroduced with no problem at all, which is absolutely fantastic news. Now, this may lead you to say, well, boy, I'm definitely not going to use the Mediterranean diet. And that would be a mistake. And the reason that would be a mistake is because of other data like this. A 2023 clinical trial that found that after three months on a Mediterranean diet, people had lower levels of leaky gut. So wait a minute. I thought Mediterranean was bad because it flared IBS symptoms. Well, this is where I think we want to be careful not to lump all people into the same dietary bucket. For those who have digestive symptoms, it seems reasonable to conclude that a Mediterranean diet, at least out of the gate, will likely flare them due to the high FODMAP content. But if we also know that one to two month adherence to low FODMAP leads to over 50% of those foods being able to be consumed later with no problem, this would indicate that you could start low FODMAP as that research group recommended personalizing the, the diet. And then you could go to more of a standard Mediterranean approach. And this is exactly the trajectory that we should be seeing someone go through when they make changes that improve their gut health, their dietary tolerance should improve. This is one of the most common things that we see in consulting with people, the complaint about food intolerances and the ability to improve their food tolerance when we do things like low FODMAP, like probiotics, potentially like an elemental diet reset. As the gut heals, you release more enzymes, you have less inflammation, you have a healthier microbiota, and all of these things allow you to better tolerate food. So this is how we reconcile the fact that the Mediterranean diet might flare symptoms, but can also reduce leaky gut. I think it depends when and who uses each diet. And so remember, the most logical starting point, if you have digestive symptoms specifically, is to start with low FODMAP one or two months and then broaden your diet to whatever dietary plan most appeals to you. 
And with that in mind, just want to make sure not to forget, we have three iterations of the low FODMAP diet that we've developed. One is the standard low FODMAP diet that will be the least restrictive. One is a paleo low FODMAP diet, which combines paleo rules along with low FODMAP rules. And then one is a vegetarian low FODMAP diet for those who want to eat a vegetarian-based plan. So there you have a number of recent studies helping us to see the limited utility of prebiotics, a reminder on the utility of probiotics, how and when we might want to consider fiber supplementation, and then also dietary options regarding low FODMAP and Mediterranean. And let me just close again by saying there are so many options that you have out there as a healthier consumer. It's great. You have so much power in your hands to improve your health, to improve your gut health. I'm hoping that these research studies and guidelines help you take all the information and organize it into an intelligent plan of uh, therapy, if you will. Um, okay. So I hope that helps guys and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. 